We're delighted to have you with us this afternoon and really looking forward to the next panel, which is looking at stakeholder capitalism and what more could be more what could be more important during this period of transition as we look towards a new economy in the wake of COVID-19. If you have any questions over the duration of the discussion, please do put them down on the COGX website or use the Slido code in order to ensure that you can get all of your ideas out there and discuss those with those who are going to be presenting later. And I'm really glad to be able to hand over to a really distinguished panel. Um, and right now we'll pass you over to Matthew Studlin, who is a um, moderator for the session today. Thank you. This is a COGEX event, as Niasha was explaining. And COGEX this year is all about asking the question, how do we get the next 10 years right? In some ways, it's quite a frightening question, given what we are facing at the moment in the form of this pandemic. But I believe we can get through it if we look deep within ourselves and talk to each other and that involves, of course, listening as well as explaining. And no more importantly than right now, given the Black Lives Movement. And I think it's quite also relevant to say that joining us are not just members of the public, but CEOs, leaders, artists, policy makers, academics and activists. So we are coming together in a collaborative way, essentially, to learn from each other. Of course, we'd all prefer to be on a physical stage, and I'd be much happier introducing my panelists this afternoon if we were all in the same room together. I hope one day in the not too distant future that we will be able to congregate again, because it is such an important part of being a human being. But we are all now, of course, used to these digital platforms, and we're becoming better and better at using them. You will, of course, later on in, in this afternoon, be able to put your questions, the questions that you feel I really should have asked to our panel. So please do contribute as well as listening. This event is about stakeholder capitalism. And we do have three fantastic contributors to help steer us through the next half an hour. Rebecca Henderson is perfectly positioned. She's a professor at Harvard University, and she's written a book actually entitled Reimagining Capitalism. And we are going to have to, I believe, reimagine capitalism in all sorts of ways in the coming months and years. Brian Comar, for his part, he works for salesforce.org. And Brian leads on the global impact work at Salesforce. Salesforce is a company that really values ethics. It takes them very seriously. Indeed, that is part, as I understand it, of its, its mission statement. And it's also worth billions. So it shows that you can inspire others to be ethical, be ethical yourself, but also be hugely successful. And I'm sure Brian will elucidate us further on that shortly. Uh, Deb Oxley, OBE, she's up in Yorkshire, and she's a chief executive of the Employee Ownership Association. And she's going to be contributing from that perspective, helping us understand how we can move forward so that more people really do genuinely have a stake in the businesses for which they work. So I haven't really said much about myself, but I'm Matt Stadlin. I'm a presenter on LBC, which stands for Leading Britain's Conversation. It's a national radio station here in Britain, but you can get it right uh, across the world. And during this session, we really will, I hope, be leading the world's conversation. If I may, I'd like to start with Rebecca, Professor Rebecca Henderson, because you have written this book, Reimagining Capitalism. And I wonder whether you might start by just defining our terms very briefly, reminding us what capitalism is and explaining what stakeholder capitalism is as well. Rebecca. Capitalism briefly, is private ownership of the means of production. So individuals own the firms and, uh, and the assets, not the state. And why does it need to be reimagined? It needs to be reimagined because it is broken. In a healthy capitalist society, you have three strong foundations, 
a democratic accountable government that sets the rules of the game, a free market and uh, free capitalism that generates prosperity and innovation, and a strong civil society. And we've let those three foundations, we've let two of them fall away so that we're seeing massive environmental damage. Many people can't, uh, can't compete in, the, in, uh, in today's world. And most people haven't seen a pay raise in 20 years. So I see stakeholder capitalism as really as a response to a, a form of capitalism, an overwhelming focus on shareholder value at any cost that is past its prime and needs to be reimagined. Thank you, Rebecca. Deb Oxley, I wonder whether I can bring you in now because you are all about empowering employees. And maybe you can start with explaining to what extent there actually is employee ownership of businesses in the UK already. Well, there is already a substantial amount of um, majority owned or wholly owned employee owned businesses. So there's about um, 200,000 people in the economy who are uh, working in that type of envir environment. But it's still a small amount of the overall uh, workplace. So in terms of, um, you know, how do we get more of that into the economy? Rebecca's stance on this and this whole debate about how do we reimagine the next 10 years and how do we reimagine capitalism is really pertinent to the opportunity to bring more employees into a position where they have not just a stake in the firm, but they have a say in the firm as well. So we've really got that collaboration and listening and talking to each other that you mentioned right up front, Matt. And Brian Comar, I said in my introduction as well that Salesforce.org wants ethics to be right at, at the heart of what it does. Do you feel that that is really possible? Are, are you living that out in, in, in actions, in the way that you're running your business, or is it just words? It, it, it's entirely possible. Uh, and I think it's very important that you talk about accountability and transparency and how to make sure that it, it, it is possible. You know, I'm coming to you live from Washington, D.C., uh, where life has felt, you know, quite a bit like a roller coaster uh, here. Uh, a few ups, uh, a lot more downs and, and certainly being thrown for, for several loops. Um, I think it's not just the pains uh, associated with the pandemic, um, but our attention here uh, and really all across the world is on, uh, of course, um, you know, racial justice. Uh, and you mentioned at the top in your introduction around the Black Lives Matters movement. Um, and it's a, it's a really difficult time. Um, and I do think that greater accountability and greater transparency is at the center of what will advance racial justice. It's also at the center of what will advance stakeholder capitalism and what we must do right uh, over the next 10 years. Uh, and Rebecca Henderson, I imagine that you didn't quite anticipate the pandemic when you began your book, Reimagining Capitalism. And I wonder whether this is a moment where real change might actually be affected, given that it feels as though the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle have been scattered far and wide, thrown up in the air. Matthew, it really feels as if we might see real change. Of course, things could go sideways. We could come out of the pandemic angrier, poorer, more afraid than we were before. But I'm really noticing a change. Six months ago, when I talked about the need to systemically rethink capitalism, everyone would look, look at me uneasily. It's like, yeah, right, Professor Henderson. Now people are super curious. I think there's a sense that things can go wrong, that they are going wrong, that the system is not working. The pandemic's like a huge flashlight that's shown what's wrong with our society. Issues of exclusion, of, of government uh, uh, incapacity, of uh, firms not stepping up to do the right thing. So I, I'm actually hopeful. I'm not optimistic. I don't think this is, but I think this might be a moment for real change. And Deb Oxley, as Chief Executive of Employee Ownership Association, how important a role does government have here? How important a role is regulation? Are, are businesses, are companies across the UK and beyond 
really going to open themselves up in a meaningful way beyond how they already have or a minority have to employee ownership without some form of coercion? Um, well, I think government has got a hugely important role to play. And just picking up from where Rebecca was talking about the the need um, for a new way um, coming out of this pandemic. And in the UK, there's been lots of talk of build back better. We know that the, the issue of corporate resilience, particularly for smaller farms, is going to be uh, one of the priorities looking ahead. And the government is already starting to think, in this country at least, about how it can take an even more involved role in helping businesses prosper beyond the pandemic and the UK government is just like the American government and many governments around the world currently stepping right into the heart of the economy to support it in a way that has never been seen before so the, the government has already had to step up and step in and I don't see that changing um, beyond the pandemic. The opportunity that Rebecca talks about to broaden capitalism. So instead of it being just about a narrow, a narrow group of owners owning the, 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 the well-being of the firm, the production process, but actually spreading that. It will require governments to step in because it will require governments to both incentivize when it's appropriate, but also to use those incentives wisely. So, you know, in, Rebecca's talked about inequality and we've got a leveling up agenda in the UK. So you can clearly see the opportunity to incentivize firms to step up to more employee ownership as a means of um, repairing some of that inequality in society. Brian, as someone who works for Salesforce and works on leading the global impact work that you do as a company, how do you feel you are incentivized? What has motivated your company to put ethics front and centre? Have you had any drawbacks? Have you had to make any sacrifices in the process? Yeah. Uh, you, you said it at the top. It's about leading with values and believing fundamentally that values create value. Um, and we've been able to see that over a, a long suspended period of time that when you're not only looking at shareholders, but when you're looking at all your stakeholders, that there is an opportunity to really drive a win-win-win for all. I think for us, we really see three fundamental changes uh, in order of bringing, you know, uh, stakeholder capitalism forward. Um, folks, we, we need new mental models. We need to think differently. We need new business models. Uh, we need to act, operate differently. Uh, and importantly, uh, we need new measurement models. We need different outcomes that we're actually measuring to. So thinking differently, acting differently, measuring differently, uh, just three small things. But uh, I actually, I think I'm, uh, we're pretty optimistic about being able to drive that forward. And Rebecca, Professor, I, I wonder from your point of view, if you could explain the differences, because they're, they're fundamental, I'm sure, but important for us all to understand between socialism, as we broadly understand it, and stakeholder capitalism. Where, where does the dividing line lie there? It depends what you mean by socialism. Sometimes I think when uh, half the millennials in the US say they favor socialism, what they really mean is decent healthcare. But if we interpret socialism to be extreme government control of the economy, the difference between socialism and stakeholder capitalism is under stakeholder capitalism, Firms are still owned by investors and employees, not by the government. Um, the government sets the rules of the game. It doesn't run the game. And that seems to me really important because I think, you know, government unchecked is just as dangerous as the free market unchecked. What we need are the two to hold each other in, in balance. So stakeholder capitalism is about firms stepping up and saying, I have a broader purpose. I'm going to do everything I can to make make a difference in the world, and I'm going to be a me member of the broader society and, and really work to make sure that we're thriving and prosperous as a whole. But I'm, I'm still making money for my investors. I'm still about the bottom line. That's super important because it's the competition and the focus on efficiency that has led capitalism to be so successful and without which I think we, weren't, we will not solve the problems that we face. The concern, I imagine, amongst many who broadly support the idea of stakeholder capitalism, list, listening to us speak this afternoon, 
is that it is quite a leap, Rebecca, from President Trump, who many people, most of the people I know, would define as the hard right president, quite a leap from his brand of politics to a brand of politics that would encourage and embrace stakeholder capitalism. He came to power claiming that he wanted to drain the swamp, but many would argue he's swimming in the swamp himself and, and making the waters of the swamp even dirtier. How do we move from a Trump presidency to the sort of politics that Bernie Sanders might have espoused, but even he was given fairly short shrift when Democrats came to choosing their nominee? In, uh, in two minutes, right? Uh, <laughs> so this is the moment where I say, well, I did write a 300 page book about this, but in two minutes, um, there's lots of room for firms to behave better right now, even given the current political environment. We have very strong evidence of billion dollar business models where firms can raise wages, treat their employees better, address environmental problems. That's clearly not enough, but it's a huge first step. And as firms start to move in that direction and their employees and their customers are increasingly pushing them to do that, they're beginning to feel the economic costs of not addressing the major problems we face. So fixing our political system so that it's more inclusive and that we have something closer to stakeholder capitalism is not just a would be nice. I view it as economically essential to the future of our economy and to the firms within it. And I think more and more leaders are seeing that. So I think we need two things if we're to move all the way. One is every firm doing everything they can with strong measurement, as Brian, um, as Brian suggests, so that we know they're living up to their commitments, and then real movement politically. A lot of that has to come from the people, of course, but I think business can play a real role in not continuing to, to push the failed policies of the past and in supporting real democratic engagement and real inclusion. I want to bring back Deb in a moment, but first to Brian, would you like to respond to what Rebecca just said? And I'd also wonder as well whether you feel that stakeholder capitalism is going to be driven more from the bottom up or from the top down. So it returns slightly to that question earlier about regulation yes. that I asked Deb. Listen, thank you. And I couldn't agree more with the professor. Um, and, you know, this is much bigger than any administration of course, yes, government has an incredibly important role to play, um, but this is bigger than government. Uh, consumers, we know, are already expressing their expectations, their changed expectations, and folks always like to you know, uh, point to the millennials. It's not just millennials. Uh, all consumers prefer to purchase from companies, uh, participate with organizations that are showing data and evidence around a much broader view of value. And it's not just uh, consumers, but it's employees too. The surveys that are happening on a weekly basis about do people want to go back to the old normal? Well, actually, very few people do. There's been a reassessment of value in society. There's been a reassessment of which jobs are the most important. Maslow's hierarchy of needs that we all remember from university and college. You know, you can see where people's panic buying at the beginning of this pandemic, where that came from. And people have really started to question why certain things in society happen, whether it's to do with, you know, the circular economy and looking at fashion, whether it's to do with, um, you know, uh, salaries of highly paid, you know, executives. Um, so I think now is the time. And if we don't use this time effectively, then it will be, you know, a shame on all of us because we cannot let society and the economy just slip back to where it was. And I agree with um, the other two speakers that I don't think consumers will let um, society slip back to where we were. I think there's there's a, going to be a demand, a pent up demand for change and stakeholder capitalism sits right at the heart of that debate. Does that resonate with you, Rebecca? Do, do you worry that we might move on from this pandemic if and when we achieve a vaccine and forget the important lessons that we've been learning, that in a sense we are only as healthy as our next door neighbour, whoever that next door neighbour may be. And that certainly in the UK, we have learned, I think, and grown to realise that jobs that perhaps we didn't sufficiently respect, either emotively or financially in the past, are absolutely at the top of the pyramid 
How do we make sure that that momentum is sustained? By all of us doing as much as we can. Many of us work for businesses. We can make a difference right where we work. It's so tempting to look to CEOs, and CEOs are amazing, and we need um, enlightened CEOs who are, who are moving their firms forward. But every CEO I know is standing on the shoulder of thousands of people or hundreds of people who are trying to make a difference in their community and with their employees. You know, when I started teaching Reimagining Capitalism, I had 28 students in the room. Now we have nearly 300. That's a third of the second year class at HBS. The dean asked me to take some of the ideas that we're talking about here into the required first year course, into our course on leadership and government. 50% of Harvard MBAs think capitalism is broken. I, I don't think we're just going to smoothly go back to the way things were. Inequality has a name and a face. In exclusion has a name and a face in a way it never did before. As I said, I'm super helpful. Brian, I wonder what you think on this, because a lot of the protesters here in the UK have seemed at least to be very young. Do you feel that the, the generation now coming of age will drive this sort of change? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and for the primary reason that they recognize that it's not a false choice, that the bottom line is that we can have growth, sustainable growth, in a way that provides for greater equity as well. Um, and that the choices that previous generations have had, uh, again, are, are not their real experiences. And that's why you see them at the center of driving what is a, a societal, a, a, a movement, a change, you know, a change movement. Um, I, I do think it's really important that, um, you know, a big part of this though, is about a new infrastructure that is needed to support this new form of capitalism. We need, harmonization across different data standards and impact standards. We need capacity building for data collection and real training uh, across different sectors. Uh, of course, we need greater leadership uh, around education and awareness around the opportunities that stakeholder capitalism provides. Uh, so I am incredibly optimistic. I think this wave, uh, we've reached this tipping point. Uh, and quite honestly, I, I don't see us going back in any way, shape or form. I'll bring Deb back in in a moment, but just on that, Rebecca, very briefly, how do we break up, if this is what we want to do, entrenched wealth, in entrenched privilege? It took over a hundred years for that statue of a slaver who, who helped enslave between 80 and 100,000 people to be ripped out of the heart of Bristol, and it took lawlessness to achieve that. So how, how do we move, as it were, from zero to hero overnight? Very carefully. For 20 years of my academic career, I was the Eastman Kodak Professor of Henderson, the Eastman Kodak Professor of Management at MIT. I studied firms that were incredibly resistant to change. Kodak could not, would not move from conventional film to digital film. How does it happen? It happens because they have to change. It happens because 100,000 entrepreneurs find a new way of doing things, because their customers insist, because their employees insist. This is not easy. This is not a walk in the park. These kinds of moments of transition are always hard. But to Brian's point, there's money on the other side. The people who stay behind lose out. Increasingly, they realize that. To Deb's point, we know how to run firms in a different way, in ways that are much more equitable and profitable and productive. We can get there. And as more and more people see that, we're going to see this transition. Deb, I, I just want to come back to you then and, and ask you about employee ownership. What are the advantages, apart from the obvious, apart from the ideological, do you find, have you found in your experience in this field, that if the, the companies that are run by their employees are actually more financially or economically efficient than those that aren't. Yeah, there's, there's, there's evidence that the performance, the economic performance, the financial performance of these businesses um, outperforms. You've only got to look at the top 50 um, employee owned businesses, which we publish every year. But you, you asked, you know, how does this happen? Well, it happens because it's at a very um, individual level. 
when a person has both a stake and a say in the business in which they work, it fundamentally changes their relationship with the firm. It changes the amount of discretional effort. It changes the amount of concern and care and pride in their work. And if you can create that perfect harmony of both of those together in a business that has a, uh, a progressive set of values and a clear purpose behind which that whole group can get together, you create a business of owners, which is an incredibly powerful thing to do. And going back to the question about socialism and capitalism, you then create an environment where it's not about socialism. It's not about capitalism. It's about socialising capital. Brian, just in 30 seconds, it's felt presenting my LBC radio shows overnight in the last couple of weeks that America was going up in flames. There have been some anarchic scenes in Britain as well. We're in the middle still of a pandemic. Are you scared about the immediate future or are you excited? I'm scared for the reality that too many uh, Americans and, and, and individuals, particularly people of color, face every day. That you know, scares me to no end. You know, the notion that a mother is scared to send her children to the store uh, to pick up, you know, a gallon of milk. Yeah, that, that, that you know, without, without potential harm uh, or even worse, death, that, that scares me tremendously. Um, I think, you know, we're a resilient society, we're resilient people. Uh, and so I am an optimist. Uh, I believe that inaction for too long a period of time results in action on the other side. Uh, but again, um, I am hopeful. Uh, I'm, I'm very optimistic, uh, along with the other speakers, and that, quite honestly, greater accountability, greater transparency from all of us in our daily actions as individuals and as organizations is a key piece of what we must do right over the next 10 years. We're running out of time, so I must sum up. Just Rebecca Henderson, Professor, just a final word from you, 10, 10 seconds or so. Are you optimistic that we will achieve a stakeholder capitalist society in Britain, in America, in the next 10 to 20 years? I don't know the time frame, but I'm sure we will because we must. So yes, I am optimistic. I want to thank all three of you very much indeed, Rebecca Henderson, Brian Comer and Deb Oxley. And I'd love you to continue, all of you who've been tuned into this event, to come back in half an hour with your questions so that I can put the questions to the panel that you feel I should have asked and neglected to do so. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you very much indeed to everyone who's joined this session and see you again in just about 30 minutes time. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.